everyone. So today we're gonna to talk about herbal remedies and herbs. This is something that really interests me. It's interested me for quite some time since I was a young girl. And it's something that I wanted to do and execute more here at Flock. So you'll probably have noticed in our gardens that we're growing herbs not only in the pollinator garden, but we've created our own herbal garden. We're growing herbs in the native meadow. We're growing herbs in the orchard. They're kind of everywhere. <laughs> They're integrated throughout all our gardens. And I plan on utilizing them quite a lot. Actually, I've started to utilize them more. I'm making my own tinctures and extracts and things along those lines. And I would encourage people, if it's something that you're interested in, you know, start reading about, start learning about. There's a lot of good peer-reviewed scientific literature out there. There's a lot of great herbal courses that you could take. There's probably herbal practitioners maybe in and around where you live. So there's options out there in order to be in touch with that a bit more and to see how you could actually integrate them within your lifestyle. So if this is something that interests you, stick around today because that's what we're gonna be covering. And this video, I should say, is actually in collaboration and in partnership with Herb Farm. And if you go to maybe a natural food store, or if you have like a Whole Foods or something around your neighborhood, you may have actually seen Herb Farm. So they do their own herbal extracts. And in many cases, they try to grow their own herbs where they can. So they have a certified organic farms in Southern Oregon that they, they grow many of their own herbs. Of course, you probably know this for yourself. If you don't have enough land or if you don't have the right kind of climate or the right kind of soil or anything along those lines, you're not able to actually grow all of those plants. Um, I cannot possibly grow all the herbs that I would like to actually use even uh, on the land here at Flock, but you know, an easier way to, to do it is to actually get extracts from somebody else and that's exactly what Herb Farm has done. So we decided to collaborate on basically some of their most popular herbs right now or their, their herbal extracts. I wasn't going to feature every single one of them, but then I thought, you know, it's kind of interesting to see where the state of our world or well-being is at by the, through the use of the herbs that we are using. Because I would imagine that if you go to a different country, they might be using a different set of herbs. Maybe, maybe not. So I figured, um, you know, they sent me six different extracts and I figured I would highlight each of them. But I also determined when I was looking at these six different extracts that they kind of fit in three different categories. So that's how I'm going to talk about these herbs today. And I won't go deep, like too in depth in the way that I typically like to go when I talk about um, herb, herbs or herbal remedies, but I will kind of do a little bit more high level. And then if this is something that actually interests you, then perhaps I could think about maybe doing uh, deep dives into specific herbs and herbal remedies. So let me know in the comments below if this is something that intrigues you. Like I said, it's something that really, it has interested me since I was a young girl. In fact, like my experiences and my memories when I was young, we had a really wonderful library that I had growing up in the upstairs of the, of the home that I grew up in. And I absconded with my mother's 1970s Rodale herb book when I was a kid. And I already had a natural inclination to nature, to the outdoors, to plants, to just understanding what I was seeing underneath my nose, like whether it was mushrooms or whether it was plants or whether it was animals or anything along those lines. And I'd often take those plants or sometimes like insects <laughs> into my house and try to raise them. Or I would be uh, pressing plants between a book and just creating all these like little natural histories so that I could understand what I'm looking at. And I don't think that's really much, you know, changed to, to now and to I'm, I'm an adult, you know, kind of look back on this. And I've talked about this on the channel before is that I feel like I'm coming full circle to that inquisitiveness that I had that when I was a child. Strangely enough, when I went to university, even though I went to university to study things within this like uh, sphere of environmental issues, ecology, that type of stuff, I kind of walked away, I walked back a little bit from those things that I explored when I was a kid. I also walked back from doing a lot of drawing, which I had done, like I would sit and draw for eight, nine, 10 hours, which is actually, you know, fairly relaxing as well. And then, you know, I would go out, spend time outdoors on my own, studying and looking at plants, observing them. That's something that I didn't really do as much when I was in university, university strangely enough. And it's probably partially because of the rigor of university. 
Um, I wasn't always taking classes in ecology. I was taking also classes in chemistry or ma the math, uh, math or maths and sciences and all this other kind of stuff that maybe didn't directly relate back to what interested me. So when you have all of that combined with the work that you're doing, um, whether it's like a work study or work positions, which I held a lot of, you know, it, it could get very overwhelming. And maybe that's the best time actually to be looking at herbs and which we'll, we'll talk about today. So that was a little side story, but I think that it's very good to reflect on the things that have interested you in the past or that interest you now. And for me, I realize that I'm kind of coming back full circle with this. I will say that I am drinking some tea here. And this is a fennel orange zest tea. And fennel is particularly good for your digestion. And I'll go into how I kind of take a little health check every morning. Um, but I've been doing like a little bit of a tongue diagnosis, which you're like, my God, you're crazy, like a tongue diagnosis. But uh, I'll have to do an episode on that. I, I won't get too much into it, but I basically stick out my tongue. I kind of take a look at my tongue and see what my tongue says. And if I, if I stick my tongue out, so bear with me and, and humor me for a minute. So I'm gonna stick my tongue out at you. Uh, you look at the shape and any of the kind of it, it, fluids on your tongue, your coating on your tongue, if there's any types of physical manifestations, so maybe there's dots or bumps or cracks or anything along those lines. Well, over the last few days, as I was sticking out my tongue and looking at it, looking at myself with my tongue out, um, I noticed that, yes, it's pink, it has a, has a good shape, it has a good size, has a decent coating on, there's nothing that's abnormal about it, but I have these indentations on the sides of my tongue. And that could be an indication that maybe my digestion's not working properly, maybe my liver and spleen isn't working as properly as it should, perhaps I'm having some stress or anxiety. And so I started to say, okay, well, if my digestion, if it's my liver, my spleen, I'm gonna take something that um, is a bit more of a digestive bitter. So I've been taking digestive bitters and I've been having this uh, fennel tea, which is particularly good for digestion as well. So like I said, Herb Farm sent me six different extracts here. So I have a bunch of them, but the two that I wanna highlight that I think could actually fit into the same category is this super echinacea right here. And also this soothing throat spray, which also has echinacea in it. Echinacea is the herb that I, I get the sense of that over the last 10 years has been highly in Western media. So it's, I think between echinacea and ginkgo, those are two herbs that I feel like are definitely in the mainstream media a lot more. And it's not necessarily so niche. And for those of you who want scientific literature on herbs to say, well, do they really, do they really work? You know, uh, you know, what is it? What is the modality that allows them to have this kind of effect or effects on my body? Well, I have to say that there is plenty of scientific literature out there. I find that herbs that are primarily growing in the United States and are not utilized in other countries, like Eastern countries specifically, there's less scientific literature. And there's a reason for that. The reason is because it's so hard to get something funded in Western societies that are strictly focused on herbal remedies. But for countries that heavily rely in modern day on herbal remedies, so a lot of Eastern countries, there is quite a lot of scientific literature that's out there. So uh, when I pull scientific literature, I often am pulling from countries like India, Japan, China, Iran, Turkey, and some uh, countries also within the European Union that, that uh, have some regulations and they use um, quite a bit of herbal remedies as well. But it's mainly from Eastern universities. Herbal remedies are something that almost 80% of the world actually uses as their primary source of medicine. So it's not really fringy or kind of airy-fairy. There, there's a lot of truth and veracity there. And if you think about our modern day medicine, which has undoubtedly given us a lot of amazing things and has allowed us and prolonged us to perhaps live longer, um, especially if we have ailments that uh, you know had no cures before, right? 
But our modern day medicine has only been around for about 200 years. So you think about that, and then you think about herbal medicines and herbal remedies, that's been around for thousands of years. And if you think about traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurveda or Siddha or Yunani or any of those types of, you know, I'm gonna call them scriptures, like herbal scriptures, they have been around and recorded for thousands of years. So 2000, 3000, 4000 years plus. And if you think about ancient society, so even societies like 12,000 years ago, what were they using? They weren't using uh, modern day pharmaceuticals. They were most likely using herbal remedies. And so the research and development, even though it's not necessarily peer reviewed scientific literature back in the day, um, that research and development, I, th I don't think could be cast aside. And I think a lot of uh, the scientific literature that you see now gives truth and veracity um, for some of the herbal remedies that we have today, which I think is very interesting because my, my brain works both ways. Like I want to see the science and the peer reviewed science journals. I want to see double blind studies. I want to see all that. Um, but then there's also this element of the, the mystery of herbs that I, I can appreciate and enjoy, especially for, for people who have like passed this tradition down from, from generation to generation. So echinacea is a very interesting one. I mean, we think about it, especially in the way that it's presented to us, is like it is a basically supporting your immune system. So echinacea, I think, is a, a one that makes sense to me, especially now as we're getting into the cold season and the, the winter season, folks are taking more echinacea. This is what the herb looks like. So this is echinacea angustifolia, but you also see echinacea purpurea which is the root of the purple coneflower. So those are the ones that are most commonly used. And purple coneflower is in cultivation everywhere. There's lots of different varieties of purple coneflower. So I can't tell you what each of those varieties, like what the chemical constitution or the phytochemicals within that plant are based on the different varieties. But one of the things that you should know is depending on even where the echinacea is growing, it'll have different chemistry. It could be the same species, not even a different, different species, but the same species. And if it's growing in two different places, the, the chemistry might actually be um, different in that plant. So for instance, if I'm growing something in my very cush pollinator garden versus it growing in kind of the rocky meadow where it has to really struggle for nutrients and for water or anything along those lines, well, the one in the meadow might actually build up way more chemistry in order to protect itself. So, you know, with that, those phytochemicals, we might be able to actually utilize those within our body. And I think that's what's really interesting is understanding what, how those phy phytochemicals actually work and, and how um, they might have an, a positive or even a negative effect on our body. So echinacea is often reported as something that is a, an immunosupportive plant. And when you tincture or when you extract that, herb farm is using organic cane alcohol. Sometimes I'll use like a, a vodka or a brandy. Uh, if you want to stay away from alcohol, people will use glycerin. It doesn't necessarily always extract all of the phytochemicals from it or the, the resins, especially if you have like a resinous herb. But um, in this case, they use organic cane alcohol for their extracts. And you could follow the suggested use on the side or if you work with an herbalist or somebody who is your medical practitioner, maybe somebody who's studied both Eastern and Western medicine, typically what you might wanna do is just, you know, kind of uh, an herb dropper like that. So you have uh, a dropper full and then you put it in about two ounces of liquid. Here I have way more liquid in here because I'm drinking um, my tea, but doing that maybe two, three, four times a day, um, depending on whether it's something that you're doing as a preventative or something for an acute issue. And then you just drink your liquid. They also have this throat spray. And again, I think this is, this makes sense to me. I mean, we've just come out of this a pandemic. We have all this uh, viruses going around. It's winter, you get cold, you get a little sniffly nose, a little sore throat. And this one uses echinacea root, okay? So uh, we talked about echinacea angustifolia, that's this one. They are using echinacea purpurea. And then they have propolis resin, so we're talking about honeybees. Hyssop flower aerial parts, so that's Hyssopus officinalis, sage salvia officinalis, and St. John's wort flowering tips, so that's Hypericum perforatum. 
and I've covered St. John's wort also in the past. So this is a throat spray. So if you're starting to get a little bit of an itchy or scratchy throat, this might be something that you want to turn to. And when I, when I read out the other herbs like Hisopis uh, officinalis or Salvia officinalis, officinalis in, at least in Western medicine, officinalis, whenever I see that in the species name, I know that was an herb that was popularly used by doctors slash botanists because many of the doctors were plantsmen and, and plantswomen, so um, botanists back in the day because those two things really really went together uh, because that, that was the use of the medicine, was our herbal remedies. So officinalis means that it was used in the officina, in the office, and that means that it is a, um, a plant that is highly used as a medicine. So these ones I felt like go together because, hey, we're hitting into the winter season. Echinacea has been widely publicized within the media. So it, it makes sense to me that these are two common ones. The next one I want to cover is this one. And this focuses on brain and memory. So this is something that really you know affects the, the mind, right? And when I think of brain and memory, and I think about all the media on herbs that are out there, I definitely think of ginkgo. And when I turned the back of this bottle, I saw that ginkgo was the second ingredient that is listed here. So ginkgo is often used to focus and to strengthen, to get rid of brain fog. So the first ingredient in this one is called goducola, and it's centella asiatica. And centella asiatica is a popular herb in Asia. Um, it's often used fresh. So it's actually one of the herbs that if we get a greenhouse here, it's one of the herbs that I, I want to, to grow because folks will often use it as a salad green. And there are great reports and there's great scientific literature on Centella Asiatica about how it is used to focus the brain, help with memory, and for any ailments that happen usually within the brain or the head. And uh, I also, strangely enough, was in the personal care product area of a grocery store the other day, and I found a personal care product. It was for the face. It was like a serum that was used for the face. And one of the primary ingredients in it was Centella Asiatica. So it's often also used um, externally for the skin, which is, uh, which is quite interesting. But let's take a look at the other ingredients that are on here. So they have uh, goticola, ginkgo, and then skull cap. These are the aerial parts of Scutellaria latifolia. So I have some skull cap here. I think this is the skull cap. Yes, right here. So this is a skull cap. There's many different species of skull cap. The ones that they use in Asia might be different from the ones that we actually use here, but we do have a lot of native skull cap. And when I think of, of skull cap, I often think of like headache. If you have a headache, that will often take a, like a skull cap tincture. So it makes sense that it's actually in this concoction of brain and memory. And then they have the salvia officinalis and also rosmarinus officinalis as well. But yeah, I mean, I think that an herbal extract for brain and memory makes a lot of sense. I mean, especially if you think about the rigors of what modern life throws at you, or you know, many of us actually work multiple jobs or just like in the hustle. We might have family that we have to actually you know, multitask with the, the stuff that we do on a daily basis in our personal lives and also our work. So the fact that brain and memory extracts, it just, it, it makes sense to me. It's totally understandable. All right, the last three that I'll feature here and that are actually quite popular, um, I don't know if you can see them all here. So I put these in kind of a broad category of more or less herbal extracts that could help you de-stress get better sleep, and if you have some kind of mild intermittent anxiety that prevents you from having a restful night, then these are herbs that could be interesting and, and you might want to venture to try. So I think you know what we're seeing is these three different popular groups of herbs or herbal extracts. So you have your 
uh, <clears throat> I have a little cough or sore throat and I want to boost my immune system. So that's kind of the echinacea category. Then you have the, I need to focus brain category. So that's go to cola and the ginkgo. And then you have this category, which is like, I need to decompress. <laughs> I need to reduce stress and I need to sleep better. So those are the types of um, herbs that we're seeing as the most popular within the United States and Western societies. So I think that's, that's pretty interesting. But let's uh, go down a little bit deeper into the, these herbal extracts. So we have one here that's called relaxing sleep. I mean, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. This is an herbal extract that will hopefully allow you to sleep better. So the herbs that are being used in here are valerian. Um, and valerian is not an herb that grows natively here, but it is an herb that you can grow here, at least in, in zone five, New York, it would be hardy here. It tends to grow a little bit more in wet areas. So you would probably find it next to your Joe Pye weed. So your Eupatorium maculatum or your bone set, for instance, those are plants that are kind of growing in a little bit more wet areas. And I see valerian actually growing um, in, in that area as well. Valerian is often used with other kind of relaxing nervine herbs. And here you could see it in a concoction of passion flower. That's a very common one. I've actually pulled out passion flower here so I could show that to you. You know, that, that's our passion flower herb. And chamomile, that's also pretty popular. So when I'm talking about chamomile and chamomile tea, you know, you often see it in kind of these sleepy time tea bags, you know, those are, those are quite common. And then um, here you also have hops. I, I do have hops, but I didn't actually pull it out. I should have, and then catnip. And I actually have that and I didn't, I didn't pull that out um, either. But those are some of the herbs that are in this relaxing sleep extract. And that totally makes sense to me. I will say there's some contraindications with some of these herbs. Valerian in particular, I will mention that some people have the opposite effect with valerian. So oftentimes they'll, they'll feel more awake when they have valerian versus a little bit uh, sleepier so and a little bit calmer. So you, you wanna try these herbs out. But I will say, I will say that the FDA does not evaluate any of these claims, these herbal claims. So this is something that you'll want to actually research yourself or to confide with an herbalist or a medical practitioner, again, maybe a medical practitioner that has studied both Eastern and Western medicine, for instance, um, it, or if you're taking herbal courses, these are things that you will want to perhaps try and dig a little bit more deeper on, because again, the FDA doesn't evaluate any of the claims that I actually share with you. And I should also say that I'm not trying to diagnose or cure or prevent any type of diseases. I'm just merely sharing some of the information out there about herbs that have been shared through time, through oral history, through writing, through all of that good stuff. So relaxing sleep, um, very common. You'll, like I said, these are a lot of herbs that you would find also in, uh, in kind of sleepy time teas. So the next one on the list is kava kava. Piper methysticum is the scientific name of this herb and it is, I know it as kava kava. Um, it's a Polynesian herb. So in Polynesia, many of the cultures will drink it quite liberally there. So oftentimes they'll, they'll take a mature rhizome or root of the Piper methysticum and they will clean it off and it's, it's a pretty robust rhizome or root and they will start to beat it and crush it. In many cases, they'll actually start to chew it. So it starts to, the saliva helps like, uh, you know, release some of the substances, uh, the potent substances within the Piper methysticum, and they'll start to mix it with water and then they'll uh, filter it off and it'll basically create this like muddy type of drink, which I mean, I'm sure some of you are like, ew, that sounds so gross. But you know, it's, you have to understand it may not be part of your culture. And then you kind of have to expand your worldview, worldview on that and say, okay, well, I understand that this is how folks extract it. Of course, there's newer, more modern ways of extracting this as well, but, um, but it's usually prepared in water, but it is often heavily used and it's heavily used to like kind of chill out, chillax, 
relax, that type of thing. And it's often done in groups, so it's not necessarily done in isolation. So for, for folks who maybe have intermittent anxiety, just kind of like a general anxiety that happens once in a while, then kava might be something that you are interested in. For somebody who might have anxiety and it's like a, it's something that you have all the time, then I wouldn't use kava. It's not something that you would want to take over long term. And there are some contraindications that I will say with kava kava. Um, some of those have been refuted because part of those contraindications may have come from uh, kind of like tainted kava kava. They might have been using different types of parts within the kava kava besides the root or the rhizome. Um, it might have had a kind of weird reaction with other medicines that people had been taken. But this was basically taken out of uh, Germany, banned it because they looked at some liver toxicities with kava kava. Um, but I think they have since reversed that ban because they started to look into it a bit more and see that you know people in Polynesia drink this liberally. Why you know why are they not having liver problems? So there's been much more scientific literature on that, and I encourage you to take a look at it. But again, it's not something that I would say is a long-term remedy by all stretch of the imagination. The last one I will highlight is ashwagandha. And ashwagandha, I have seen actually make more of a, a move into our media here in Western culture. This is something that has been used in Eastern medicine, like in Ayurveda, for instance, for a very long time. In fact, it is an herb that is used on a more, more than regular basis. And ashwagandha is a type of adaptogen. So when I think about herbs that are adaptogens, they, they really help modulate stress and stress levels over time. So this is a real modern day herb because I think more and more folks are saying, hey, I'm stressed on a daily basis, whether it's stress, you're stressed because of finances, whether you're stressed because of uh, a dynamic within your family, whether it's stressed because of something that's happening in your job or a combination thereof, we do experience a lot of stress and we have to kind of figure out, well, what are the tools in my tool belt that I could use and help, help to modulate that stress? And ashwagandha really is that herb. I see it in, in powders for people who wa are wanting to do smoothies. Some folks actually cook with it. This is obviously an extract here. And you know, it's funny because the, the name ashwagandha, I guess it means smelling like a horse. Smelling like a horse may mean the scent, but it could also mean the way, the, the aura of a horse. So the, the amount of vitality and energy that could happen. So this is considered more of a, even says here on the thing, it's energy and vitality. But the funny thing is, is that when it could be an energetic herb, but when it helps de-stress you, it allows you to sleep better as well. So those two things seem to be counterintuitive that it could give you energy, but then also allow you to sleep better. But because of its ability to be able to de-stress the body, de-stress the mind, then it allows you to relax a bit more as well. Part of what makes ashwagandha and the modality of it work is uh, they have a number of chemical constituents within ashwagandha that mimic the steroids within our body. So again, when you start to look at the literature, the scientific literature, and you start to look at the chemistry within the specific herbs or herbal remedies or herbal extracts, then you start to realize more of like the modality of how it actually affects both positively and negatively the, the body or why you might take some herbs for brief amounts of time while others you would take for longer periods of time. So I thought this was very interesting to see that these were the most popular herbs. I was actually surprised to see that turmeric or some type of herbal extract with turmeric was not in the most popular herbs. And I say that because I take turmeric daily, practically, um, and both of my parents actually take turmeric and they, they've been separated. So they've actually discovered turmeric on their own terms and not, they haven't been influenced by one another is basically what I'm saying. So my mom takes turmeric, my dad takes turmeric. It's very good for kind of joint issues. It's considered an antimicrobial, it's considered an antiviral. I'll probably highlight that herb in the future. I was shocked that that wasn't actually one because I feel like that has definitely made its way more into uh, Western media. 
Now, I will say I will create herbal extracts and if you're growing your own plants, you could do that yourself. So this one is an extract that is for external use only. If you're doing an extract for external use only, you should write that very clearly on the top of your mason jar or whatever you're actually using um, to extract. And this is because I'm using like a, a witch hazel on this one in order to be able to extract. And that's not something that I want to ingest. So that's external use only. And this Hypericum perforatum is also external use only. And I think I'm using a, a witch hazel. What's interesting about Hypericum perforatum, I've mentioned this before, is the, the resins, the glands in Hypericum perforatum, which is St. John's wort, actually are red, so they pull out this red color, which looks totally rad, it looks super cool. But people will take Hypericum perforatum both internally and externally, but again, it depends on the menstruum that you're using in order to be able to pull out the, all the phytochemicals um, that are in there. And then this one is something that you can imbibe. This is Queen Anne's Lace, Daucus Corota. It was, I ended up um, taking a number of cuttings of Queen Anne's Lace which is also an, a, a good medicinal. And it's because we had so much of it growing in our native meadow. It's not something that we planted, but it's definitely in the seed bank and it came up and I was like, well, it came up. I'm gonna start using it as a, as a medicine. <laughs> so just cause to show you, just to be observe what's around you. And if you're a little curious, find out what it's, it's used for. And if you don't have the space to grow things, if you don't have the space to make your own stuff because it does take quite a bit of space over time. You can imagine how much this stuff, um, you're extracting it, you're making it, moving it. And with all this stuff that is going on in the world, you might say, oh, that's not as important to me right now. But it's awesome to have companies like Herb Farm to actually do this for you if it's meaningful for you. So I encourage you to take a look at what they have to offer and to actually become more interested in herbs and to, to maybe be a bit more open-minded if it's not something that you had considered at some point, because I have to say with like health insurance rising, I took a look at the rates for health insurance in 2023. Holy crap. Like it's getting to a point where it's like, so it's, it's been unaffordable, unaffordable for quite some time, but now my own rates for my health insurance are going up $200 and then I, a month, $200 a month. And I, and, and I'm a healthy person. I'm a relatively like healthy person who takes a lot of preventative measures and eats well and I, I don't drink and I don't smoke or anything along those lines. So I, I don't have that much to worry about um, in, in my, on a regular basis. And then I was looking at this health, these health insurance costs and I'm like, holy crap, like these are, this is so expensive. And then I went to see if even any of my doctors that I would go to for physical examinations or anything along those lines actually take this insurance and they don't. So I kind of feel like it's just like highway, highway robbery. Here you are getting the, the base health insurance, which is already way so, so expensive and none of your doctors even take it. It's like, what is this? So I, I really encourage folks to, to take a look at their health, to be more aware of their body and their mind and their spirit and what we could do um, individually and together to be healthier. And I think herbs are a wonderful start. And like I said, 80% uh, of the world actually relies on herbs as their primary source of medicine. So that should say something to, to, to folks out there, even though we might have been you know grown up with a, a very narrow view of what uh, medicine or what health or what healthcare looks like just know that when you start to broaden your perspective and you start to see what other folks are actually using that there's something else that's out there so thank you guys if you enjoyed this talk this lecture <laughs> this discussion um, let us know in the comments below um, i do want to cover herbs a lot more so if that's something that actually interests you, let me know in the comments below. And thank you all for your support of this channel. I really appreciate it. We really appreciate it. And it actually goes a long way because 10% of our Google AdSense revenue is being reinvested back into community-based projects here in the Finger Lakes, which is awesome. It's a way for us to give back to the community and to invest in our community and to keep that money in the community. So your viewership and your support of this channel, it actually really does matter. It goes a long way. And what's awesome about it is that we have another partner, Espoma Organic, that basically matches those funds 
So it basically is double, you know, double the impact. So we really appreciate them and we really appreciate our partners and our sponsors like Herb Farm, um, which does an excellent product that I buy anyway. <laughs> So it's wonderful to see partners and sponsors come together in order to be able to create really educational content for you that I hope actually leaves a positive impact in your life. All right, guys, I'll see you later. Bye.